and makes sense when you're talking about mythological creatures that really, I mean, do they have to hurt each other in a traditional way? That's very human. But if they're supernatural, then they're going to fight on a totally different level. Metaphysical level where it just like becomes whole spectacle. And I think especially uh, in the written word, having some kind of philosophical fight scene would actually be, might even be easier than doing mm-hmm. it in, in film, which is, it's usually the other way around. Welcome to Speculative Sandbox, your audio playground for creative storytellers. My name is Vicki Lawn, and each episode, I and a guest will unpack a fiction trope with an eye for character development and narrative structures. Make sure to look for Speculative Sandbox on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter, where you can join the conversation. Leave comments or questions, or let us know what other tropes we should cover. When the real world just doesn't cut it, let's get lost in a fictional one. No, not that kind of fighting word, although that certainly plays a part. Fight sequences. They're the ultimate showdown between protagonist and antagonist. Whether physical, emotional, or metaphysical, fight sequences are not only thrilling, they should mean something to the overall plot. I'm so excited to bring writer Matthew C. Brown back to the podcast to talk about fighting words. You may remember him from our episodes on problematic protagonists and shared universes. This time we talk about our favorite fights and how to write them. How's your morning going so far? Oh, not too bad. I well, I don't know. I went to the dentist, and that's not fun. <gasps> I went to the dentist too. Oh my god! Did you have to get a cavity filled also? Um, I have three that I schedule oh, for September. No. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, I I was in last week, and they were just like, "Oh, you got two cavities." And I'm like, "You, I what now?" And I like right. It was so funny. Like literally before we moved from Nashville, uh, I like had I went to the dentist like two days before we moved, and they had to fill a cavity. Uh, oh. So I was trying to like move boxes and stuff when my mouth was numb. <laughs> and I was just like, oh, this is terrible. And like, I don't know, they found like three at the time. Oh. And I got like real anxious about my teeth. Uh, and I've been like doing pretty well for the past couple of years. And then this last time they were just like, oh, like you got two cavities. And I'm like, oh, great. Oh, yeah. I've had the same dentist for over 20 years. It was like a family dentist. And he suddenly right after maybe even during COVID just sold the business disappeared and the next time i went in it was a different dentist different staff entirely i was like what Uh... and i i've noticed that this guy has i can tell us a difference in the the treatments like they use laser cleaning laser drills rather Uh, than like the traditional drills and they have all these processes i've never experienced before and i'm like maybe my dentist is really old school but My new hygienist is really rough. I have to listen to music (laughs) and take Tylenol before I go. And I'm like, is this normal? (laughs) I don't know. My, my family dentist originally was just so like, I don't know. She was, it was, it was the classic, like your gums are bleeding a lot. I'm like, you are scraping my gums with your hook. Uh, and I felt like I didn't get a good, I didn't get like a legitimately good cleaning until I finally moved out. And it was just like, oh, is this what oh. it's supposed to be like? Like act, doctors that don't make me feel like I'm destroying my teeth every day. Yeah, I know. I, I have a perfectionism problem. And so as they're ca- talking to each other, talking about my gum sizes and stuff, I'm just like, where am I messing up? You know, like it gives me so much anxiety. <laughs> uh-huh. I was anxious about scheduling any teeth, like actual uh, getting my cavities done this month because I've gotten all these episodes to record back to back to back and I really didn't want to have to figure out how to get around the numbing and healing um so I'm glad that at least it's just a cleaning today uh do you have to do, did you also get your cavities done today or just the cleaning? I got them I got them filled this morning but I had it scheduled so it was like 10 o'clock over by me so that was like what it's like five ish hours before okay. now so like it, you can talk I had, <laughs> I had I had looked and I mean I wasn't it, it I, and I was talking pretty okay after the appointment um so but I had planned it like okay like it should wear off by that time uh, mm-hmm. so I should have been still good to talk but I was also pretty good after that so it ended and didn't end up being as bad as I thought it was I was just 
I couldn't really drink anything because it would slop out of my mouth. Oh. Just like, oh. Yeah, favorite thing. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're here. You anyway. don't sound like you went through any kind of procedure. So that's good. good. Uh, thank you for coming back. This is now uh, take three with you, right? This is the third. Yes, I, th I think so. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I, I know we have repeat uh, listeners who already know who you are, but can you introduce yourself a little bit, especially for our newcomers? Uh, my name is Matthew C. Brown. I am a science fiction uh, fantasy writer. Um, I've most recently released a short story, which is up on my website uh, at mattbrownwrites.com. It is a sci-fi Western story. If you like cowboys with velociraptors, I'm your guy. I love the story. Someone who lives in the wild, wild west myself, I really was drawn to your world building and how you played with the desert landscape. Um, I won't say too much other than you have, they're called night cactus, right? Yes, the night cacti. The night cactus, <laughs> um, which I think is such a creative way of looking at uh, the world around where, where I am, at least. I look out my window, there's tons of cacti right now. And I'm just like, could you imagine if those things were burning at night? Um, it, amazing, amazing. Thank you. That's one of, definitely one of my favorite uh, fauna, flora or fauna in the in the world building. Mm-hmm. All right. So today we are talking about fight scenes, which I find to be really fun and interesting because there's the fight scenes you watch, but then as, as anything in entertainment, everything that kind of, everything has to start from one place, which means it has to be written down. So whether or not you're watching a movie, a Kung Fu movie, or just a, a James Bond movie, and you have all the intricacies of editing and action sequences, you still have to write it down. And then of course you have fight scenes in books. So let's jump in. What is a fight scene and what part does it play in the overall story? So I think a fight scene can be best described as a physical confrontation between two or more people. I say typically because uh, in some cases, like the characters might not be actually physically touching. I mean, there's a difference between if it's a, uh, you know, if it is like a Kung Fu hand-to-hand -hand fight and then like, I don't know, if it's a Western showdown, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's two very, you know, they're, they're, they're using guns, they're not actually hitting each other, but you, you could still call that a fight because they're both trying to, you know, cause harm uh, to each other. Uh, and you know, these fight scenes could range anywhere from being like a one-on-one -on -one duel to kind of like a small group brawl or like a full scale battle that you might see in like a historical war movie or Game of Thrones or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I always find that fight scenes, I think in order to have like a lot of impact plot wise, they have to have some sort of impact on on the motives of the stakes that the characters are fighting. I think about like the bare bones. I always think of boxing movies uh, where, all right, you've got to fight. It literally, it's a fight scene. You've got two people in the ring and they're duking it out. But that fight has to mean something beyond just the fight itself, whether it's the main character fighting for freedom or approval or validation, um, it has to feed into something. Exactly. Like every single Rocky movie, um, it's not just about, there's all this build up to the fight itself uh you know and they always kind of have a different motive behind each of them uh you know like in the first movie it's like he's he's an underdog he's being given a shot uh, against the champion and in the second one it was like he gets you know he did so good the first time and it's kind of like okay you have to prove that that wasn't a fluke uh mm -hmm. and so every single time there's some new motivation and it's just like you know you, you if you watch the the boxing scene itself you know it's it's obviously entertaining because I mean, people watch boxing all the time. Like they just like watching people slug mm -hmm. each other out, but it, the whole movie builds up a story to it. There's all this leading up in terms of character motivation, you know, and I mean, we can have, we can obviously have movies where fighting is just the shtick. You know, if you go to see John Wick, you're not really going because you want to see like John Wick have a huge character arc you mostly just want to see him kick a bunch of people's butts mm -hmm. uh, like you know like if you have a movie like that you know that's just, that's just what you go in for you, you go in for strictly an action movie you just want to see some really cool action and you can get that uh, you know hopefully with at least some engaging stakes to surround it what I love about the John Wick movies is because I, I I'm actually one of those weird viewers that doesn't like 
isn't as enthusiastic about the fight scenes. I love the lore, the mythology that I think fuels the fight scenes and makes them really interesting and forms the characters. Um, and of course, all the the lighting and the world building and the set designs that come with that. It's it's a beautiful movie to watch, even though it's very violent. Yeah, it is kind of unique in that regard because, uh, it, you know, they do have that interesting underworld, which, you know, if you just watch the first movie, it's very, they don't do a whole lot with it. It's kind of kept very mysterious. Mm -hmm. uh, and they obviously have built upon that with each successive movie which i think makes sense like if you're gonna keep us engaged um in a movie like that because i mean the first movie is pretty much just straightforward revenge movie uh with i mean and let's be real it's a very powerful motive they killed his dog yeah like i mean if you shorthand wants to get uh anybody to feel sympathetic for someone bad guy killed their dog you are going to be totally in their corner for mm -hmm. the entire like 90 minute 100 minute run i love that there is a website i believe it's does the dog die.com yeah. yes yes there is yes there is we just we uh we were watching the movie prey and my wife looked that up right before we watched the movie <laughs> <laughs> it's an important resource like i've it, used it, it so is. many times <laughs> it is uh, some other examples I have for like what defines a fight scene um, as far as character development goes, you know, the classic, I, I think of Back to the Future, um, the father's name, which I'm forgetting, uh, against Biff in the is first George? movie. George? George, yes. yes. George is just this pathetic underdog. And, you know, Michael J. Fox's character is trying to push up his confidence the entire time. And, and at the very end, you see him finally defending himself in a very short, you know, fight scene. But it shows like we're, we're, the, the stakes are all there. We're all hanging by the same stakes as whether or not this guy could even accomplish defending himself. And, and it comes through there. And then the other type of fight scene I, I really like is actually not your traditional physical fight scene. Because you talked about like a physical fight scene versus a non-physical fight scene. Um, I like philosophical fight scenes. <laughs> So um, have you been watching, you've been watching The Sandman, right? I, I haven't. Um, okay. I, I, I've, it's so surprising for as much as I like Neil Gaiman, uh, I have never read Sandman. And I, I know the series has gotten some great reviews so far, but I'm kind of stuck in the, uh, do I want to watch that or read it first? Uh, oh, but... okay. Good point. Um, I just decided to jump. I, I jumped into him. I'm going to give it one episode and see, because I haven't read either. I've read American Gods. I've read some of his other stuff. Um, but I, I, what is it? Everworld? Is that his other book or Evermore? Uh, never, Nevermore, I believe. Nevermore. Yes, yeah. I've read that. And so I've always loved the way he approaches mythologies. And after the first episode, I was like, okay, we're going to keep going and see what this is about. I love that the main character makes me think of like the t early 2000s scene kid. He's a total emo guy <laughs> like with the sideways hair he just needs eyeliner so I'm just really it's fun for me to watch him but the there's a fight scene I'm almost hesitant to say it now but okay later on between two characters there is a philosophical fight scene and you think that it's going to be a physical one but instead what they do is they present concepts and the concepts are about uh, symbols of violence like I am a dire wolf and the other person says well actually I'm a hunter and I shoot your dire dire wolf and the other person counters and says I'm a snake and the other you know what I mean they go back uh, the other one says I'm I'm a what a bird of prey and they keep building and building and building until they're talking about I'm the world and I am a supernova and I am the universe and I am antimatter it becomes super philosophical but at the same time they're creating visuals and and as they're hurting each other philosophically, it's having an effect on their physical body, which I thought was so unique and makes sense when you're talking about mythological creatures that really, I mean, do they have to hurt each other in a traditional way? That's very human, you know, but if they're supernatural, then they're going to fight on a totally different level. Yeah, I'm always fascinated by the different way, uh, different ways people can come up with uh, fight scenes that just evolve beyond just the simple punching and kicking and whatnot uh especially when you when you can get to this whole other like metaphysical level where it just like becomes you know it becomes this whole spectacle and i think especially uh that should especially i can't think of any examples off the top of my head but like uh in the written word having some kind of philosophical fight scene 
uh, would actually be might even be easier than doing mm-hmm. it in in film, which is it's usually the other way around. Yeah, that's very true. Um, an, another example I have too of, of a non fight scene. Well, it starts off it's Marvel. You have to have a fight scene, but at the end of One Division where vision is fighting white vision and they just yes. stop and have a philosophical discussion <laughs> i know i love that whole that whole bit uh, mm-hmm. and they're just like rapidly figuring out yes yes that is another great example yeah so then based off of how we've defined fight scenes and the parts they play in the stories what are some iconic ones your absolute favorites <laughs> So before I sat down to write this, I had to stop myself and say, like, Matthew, you cannot talk about Star Wars the entire time <laughs> because as you got to give a chance for some other movies. <laughs> so I tried to really narrow my focus here. But yeah. uh, I did, uh, the first thing that did come to my mind uh, was the uh, duel between Luke and Vader in The Empire Strikes Back. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know it's interesting with Star Wars because they're obviously chock full of fight scenes and the lightsaber duels are always a big highlight Uh, and you know I know that most people would say that the uh, lightsaber duels you see in the prequel movies are better on a technical level Uh, and you know I and I agree with that but I think if you're talking about a fight scene that serves the story better I think the original trilogy uh does a bit of a better job mm. uh, with that. So that's kind of why, that's why I decided to go with Luke versus Vader uh, mm-hmm. as just an incredibly iconic fight scene, arguably the most in the whole tri- in the whole saga. It's interesting too that, that you mentioned that as far as like how it contributes to the story and plot and characters, because if you're just looking at it for the flash, then you look at the prequels and they're just, it's a dance, right? They're it very is, yeah. advanced. Yeah, they are. And I mean, that does fit, obviously, with the if you're going into like the the world building of uh, the world building of Star Wars that like the the prequel movies, they feature Jedi in their prime. So, Mm -hmm. yes, like it makes sense that they would be faster, more intense. These are people that have been training since childhood Mm -hmm. in these roles. Um, And I mean, they are great fights and I love them. But like most of them, uh, most of them are just for flash and for Mm -hmm. technicality and they're there because you expect them to be there like i think you i think the most arguably the most uh the one that serves the story most is anakin versus obi-wan at the Mm. end of avenger the sith but even that like it's a long fight like did it need to and i and i want to say this before anyone gets mad i love that (laughs) fight it is wonderful did it need to be that long like like we get a lot of the emotional turmoil in the fight uh, and we understand uh, the struggle between the two characters and why it's such an emotional battle. But still, I mean, I don't, and I haven't compared the actual running times, but I know that that's the, I'm pretty sure that's the longest lightsaber duel out of anything in the entire, in the entire saga. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I think that Luke versus Vader, just like, there's just so much built up to it because this is the first this is the first time that our protagonist and antagonist meet face to face. Like it's not, it weirdly hasn't happened yet. You're usually when you're talking about any kind of like science fiction fantasy movie, like they've, they've maybe faced off at least once. And this is the end of the second movie. Mm. Uh, No, go ahead. No, that's a good point. Because when you think about the first movie, it's just solely a, it's a rescue mission. And they blow up a build, uh, well, building. They blow up a spaceship. <laughs> they blow up a lot. <laughs> but at this whole time, they're completely on opposite ends of like meeting each other. That is very exactly. unusual. Do you think yeah. that would fly now today if like you were to pitch the A New Hope? Um, I don't know. I mean, uh, I think if you approach it from the point of view of like framing New Hope as a classic fantasy story in the under the lens of a space opera i think that would work Mm -hmm. um but i mean i mean i remember as a kid being a little disappointed that luke didn't get to have a lightsaber duel uh uh, in the first movie like and i mean obviously now i understand why you know that doesn't really work and i mean i don't think it would have been a better movie to actually have it in there but you you're kind of expecting it yeah uh and then now this is and which but that just makes it all the more uh tense Mm -hmm. because now it's like okay now he's actually had training uh and now he actually gets to go up against 
Vader. But the thing is, like, we're we actually really don't know how it's gonna go because literally, I mean, Yoda and Obi Wan were both like, "Look, you're not ready," and we also know that he's not ready either. Like, we're like, "Yeah, like he's still pretty inexperienced," but he he goes to do it anyway because he wants to save his friends because he knows mm-hmm. they're in trouble. Which I mean, that's just you know, that's just Luke. Luke Luke's like, "Yeah, I, I know it's dangerous, but I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go anyway." When um, I first watched that movie, by the way, from the part where he's training and then decides to go save them, I had so much anxiety because I looked at what he trained on and what he was planning to do, and I'm like, I don't even feel ready. <laughs> no, not not at all. Um, and I mean, especially since we've seen, I mean, Vader, Vader's like almost never been. Uh, Vader's had like the upper hand for pretty much you know, two whole movies now. The only time he's ever really been caught off guard was uh, like during the Death Star Trench one when he gets knocked off course. But otherwise he's, he's powerful. We, I mean, he, he defeated Obi-Wan. I mean, you could debate whether he quote unquote defeated him. Uh, Obi-Wan sacrificed himself. But any, anyway, not to get too technical. Uh, but when we watch this fight, uh, you know, it's, it's clear that Luke is giving it his all. Like he really is trying to fight Vader because he thinks that this is the man that killed my father. This is the man that killed Ben Kenobi. This is the man that uh, put my friends in danger and I'm going to defeat him. And then you have Vader who is just clearly toying with him for most of the fight. He could have killed Luke several times, mm-hmm. but he doesn't, which we, we learn why he doesn't kill Luke. Uh, and I think that's the other thing is that at the end of the fight, at the end of the movie, Luke loses. Yeah. And like he loses pretty badly. He 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 I mean he loses a hand, he's beaten and scarred, and he mentally, uh, after the great revelation, he is mentally just messed up. Mm-hmm. You know, and like and and that's the thing, that's where the movie ends. Like most of the time, if the hero loses a fight, it's like maybe like act two, you know, or mm-hmm. the, you know, like if they lose, if they're gonna lose a fight it's going to be earlier in the movie so that they can then like beat the villain later when they're better or they've, you know, learned the power of friendship or something like that. Uh, <laughs> and then, and then they can be, but no, Luke loses just straight up loses. And he is just left in just an absolute, the lowest he's ever been in the whole uh, series of movies thus far. Yeah. What did you think of the, in the Obi-Wan series, the final confrontation between Obi-Wan and Darth Vader. I was like just holding my hands up to my mouth, like <laughs> just like shaking the whole time. And I actually thought that fight, I'm going to get, this is going to be controversial, I'm sure. But I, I got a lot more emotion out of that fight than I did uh, Revenge of the Sith. Mm-hmm. Um, and it had nothing to do with the actual technical ability, although there were some things that I just loved on a fight choreography perspective on the obi-wan series but it was just the fact that like you know i mean you have like obi-wan has finally like you know decided to stop running he's finally decided to try and confront vader um and uh you know we've seen him go through that development and you also see uh from anakin for anakin it's like he is just so focused on trying to take obi-wan down like that is just the only thing he has cared about it. It's just, uh, and and so that just loads up the whole fight. Where and and it's crazy because we know you would think that the stakes would feel kind of low because it's like we know that neither of them die. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you would think that that kind of removes the stakes, uh, but I don't feel like it does because we're so emotionally invested, and especially at the end, uh, like. I, and you could argue that something does kind of die at the end, because at the end of that fight, Obi-Wan really just kind of accepts, like, Anakin is gone. Mm-hmm. You know, Vader even says it, like, I killed Anakin. Like, he's dead. He's gone. And I think that's when Obi-Wan finally just accepts it. Like, yep, that that's it. There's there's nothing more I can do to save my friend. He's he's gone. Yeah. Uh, and I feel like that that's just, that just hits you hard. Oh, it hit me hard. And I feel like that, I, I have this theory, because, okay, cinematically the obi-wan show did so much more for character development and relationships just because of the style the lighting the settings um i have a theory that the prequels 
feel more like a ballet. I'll get to that in a minute. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> oh, you see it too. Okay, good. Because, um, and okay, so regarding the Obi Wan thing, I needed that connection too, uh, because Darth Vader has gone on to become a leg, like what was already a legacy uh, character, but went on beyond the prequels to even a bigger legacy uh whether it's through you know the side um canon materials or in the parks or being referenced in the sequels and i had a really hard time reconciling the anakin of the prequels to the darth vader and what i loved about this was it allowed that emotion to build um whereas when i would watch the prequels it's first of all filmed like everything's on a stage obviously um very wooden and then the dancing uh, dancing the fighting is a dance it's like i'm literally watching segments of nutcracker but it's dan uh, it's fight scenes instead and the music is non-stop that drove me crazy <laughs> the, the non-stop music that literally informs you of every single emotional cue very ballet so anyway that's my 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 take there is a clip somewhere of uh like George Lucas walking into the office of his production staff or whatever before pre-production on a uh, Venge of the Sith and he like he's just finished writing the script and everyone's clapping and he's and he's like there's a lot of they fight like that he just wrote they fight in the script <laughs> which I mean again like what I mean what are you gonna do like obviously like you're just writing the script like you can't write it beat for beat in there but it it does say something when it's just like uh we're not really putting as many emotional beats in the actual fight we're just mm -hmm. gonna let them make a dance and do the choreography uh, yeah. and let that kind of stand on its own. I have some other, are you ready to go away from Star Wars for a little bit or? Yes, yes, okay. please, yes, we, we can go, we can go. I love talking about Star Wars, by the way. I just wanted to talk about my next item and didn't want it to be like, all right, enough Star Wars because I love Star Wars and I can talk forever about it as well. One fight scene that I really like that really stood out to me because it's not it like the emotional, okay. Have you seen Netflix's Daredevil series? Yes. Okay. The hallway fight scene. Oh, I'm so I... glad you brought this up. <sighs> yes. Okay. Uh, okay. I love it for multiple reasons. Number one, it's like one big long take. And that allows us to see some very unique things. He's trying to rescue a child, I believe. I'm going off of memory here. And yep, he's right. working. He's right. Am I right? Yeah, you're right. Okay. So then you walk down. He, he has to fight a bunch of guys in a hallway and... It's just that one pan shot and you see him rolling in and out of the side rooms, in and out of doorways, back into the hall, gets a child, walks out. But you, because it's one constant take, you are seeing the physical strain and you realize how mortal this character is, but yet he persists because the point to save this child is so important. And then of course, um, you talk about the talent that gets that is that need that is needed for a one take shot like this for the st um, for the stunt people, the actor, um, lighting, even the coordination of the camera. Uh, it really just all told a really cohesive story. So one of my favorites, hands down. You could have you could take that uh, whole scene like if they had just. And I mean, they obviously wouldn't do this because they got to put out full length episodes. But if they had just released that, and that and that was meant to be just like an episode on its own, it would work, mm -hmm. and and people would love it. Just the way it's shot, and I think and you really hit the nail on the head with the physical toll because that's something that uh, I feel like in movies it's a little harder to really communicate the uh, the weariness of fighting uh like because sometimes they just don't sometimes they're just you know superhuman and they don't really show a lot of that or they only show it like at a specific point in the battle like toward the end and here because it's all continuous you you see and, and that's a thing that's a staple for most of the daredevil show is just he just gets tired because mm -hmm. uh, he's just he's a, he's mortal you know he's just one guy he has a you know he has his uh, superpower but he's not you know physically any different than a normal guy Mm -hmm. uh, and you really that really does come across very clear in that particular scene yes what other ones do you have um i had picked uh, uh moving uh to a more like larger battle scale uh one of my you know the, the lord of the rings trilogy mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. obviously stacked with battle scenes and fight scenes my personal favorite is the battle of amon hen which is the final battle in the fellowship of the ring um, and that's a much smaller battle 
uh, compare it to something like uh, Helm's Deep from Two Towers or mm -hmm. Helenor Fields, but I love it because the dramatic tension and emotion is just through the roof. Uh, for that is fight. that where they all separate afterwards? I'm, That's where speaking. they all separate because okay. Frodo realizes that he has to finish the quest on his own and Aragorn is like, yeah, he does. And so really the whole point of that is just, uh, you know, the fellowship is fighting so that Frodo can get away. Mm -hmm. Like this is mm -hmm. not, and one of my favorite tropes is just like a small force of like extraordinary uh, heroes, like facing overwhelming odds in their fight. It's, you know, eight people, you know, and four of them are hobbits who aren't particularly good in battle versus like 100 Urukai. And, you know, then they're not even really trying to win. It's that they're trying to make sure Frodo can, you know, get across the river. Mm -hmm. uh, so like they just, you know, that the whole fight is just them trying to just protect him. And uh, it's just very different than like, the typical goal being just like one side is trying to beat the other yeah. like obviously they want to live but that's not what their that's not what their goal is their goal is to defend Frodo mm -hmm. uh and it's just you know the whole time it's just uh, it's just electrifying because it's all this selflessness and of the course and then of course you know it ends with one of the fellowship getting killed mm -hmm. uh which really just I mean, that's like, that's the second time in the movie that someone is dying. Uh, I mean, I know that Gandalf doesn't actually die, but to us, I mean, when yeah. I first watched that movie, not having read the book, I was like, wait, is he like dead, dead? He's dead. He's not coming back. Mm -hmm. Cause he didn't, he didn't show up later. Like we thought he would, uh, you know, and that just really kind of highlights the self-sacrifice nature of this particular fight. I love talking about some of these these classic films. I say classic, they don't feel classic. Maybe because I'm I'm getting old. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> especially when we talk about how like some of these, like I feel like the going back real quick to Star Wars, the Luke Vader, how the standoff happens later in the series rather than in the first movie. And you I, I find that a lot of movies that try to copy that fast forward it, you know, that model. Oh, absolutely. And, try, and you have this as well, where you have um the sad the sad cliffhanger um i had a really hard time with this cliffhanger because so i read parts of the book as a child didn't get through all of it saw the movie the movie was a helpful way for me to understand the book uh both movie and the book was i was like yes you have this community of people coming together to help and i was really devastated when they broke up and i was like do i want to read the next book where they're separated just because i thought it was they were so strong together um, and I, you feel like a security blanket, you know, you, like each person brings their own skill set and, and training. And now that security blanket is gone. And it's kind of scary from that point it, forward. It really is. And I don't, and not when you're talking about a trilogy, I feel like the first movie usually ends pretty triumphantly for the good guys, for the most part. Like if you think about, you know, the first Star Wars movie, the first Matrix movie, or, uh, you know, the, the, mo most of the time, like the first movie ends pretty good. For the heroes in here it like doesn't really like like most of them live and that's about it like that like yeah, the bad guy doesn't have the ring and that's really the only plus mm -hmm. uh, about the whole thing but otherwise like they're they're in shambles yeah i have one other and i'm trying to i, I would like to but but i don't think mine's that great i just put there, the matrix movies <laughs> okay um, i purposely did not mention i personally did not go into them because i figured that you would probably want to do that <laughs> okay well so then we have the matrix movies which i they stand out to me simply because visually they set a standard that was iconic the bullet time um filming style and how they elevated science fiction fighting as a result and uh, you've seen it copied I mean, they copied it in Smallville almost immediately after where you have Clark Kent running in slow motion. Everything's in slow motion. He's just kind of sauntering around, but really he's really fast. Um, and I have yet, and I guess this is a question more to you. Have you seen anything since that has revolutionized fight filmmaking? Uh, I mean, I don't know if I'd say revolution. I mean, I would say influenced. Um, and I, I had made notes about this for a later question, but, uh, uh, a lot of action movies tried to kind of copy the style of the Bourne movies um, after mm -hmm. those came out, where the action is very like 
quick like it's it's very it's not like it's the it's kind of the op it's the exact opposite of the daredevil uh fight scene where it's a lot of quick cuts mm -hmm. uh which is and uh you know a little bit of shaky camera in there which is really meant to kind of demonstrate just the quick and deadly efficiency that jason Bourne has uh, and a lot of action movies after that did try to uh did try to incorporate uh like the quick cut shaky cam method of shooting an action scene which i wouldn't say it's revolutionary in the same way that like the matrix was uh mm -hmm. but it certainly did influence other movies i i saw that i think i you and i talked about this very briefly um the tight editing in james bond quantum of solace which is the one that came out directly after Casino Royale, right? Yes. I hope I have. Okay. Yeah. I remember loving Casino Royale. I know that they, they revolutionized James Bond, new actor, new approach to him. And then Quantum of Solace rolls in and the action scenes were so like cut up that I couldn't actually tell what was happening. That was how tight they were. And I was kind of sad. And then I lost my own personal stakes. I didn't feel worried about him because I couldn't even follow the, the action. And this isn't me being old. This is me like in my 20s. <laughs> I couldn't no, figure no, it no. out. I, I agree. It, it, Quantum of Solace is, I mean, there's a lot of good things I do like about the movie, but they don't really, they don't really uh, get all the way there. It's definitely the, and I haven't seen, uh, no time to die yet but i do think it is the weakest of the craig movies okay so then going going off from here yeah getting in this other way i know a lot of people are probably worried okay um you guys have talked about all these great things what are what are some bad things so that we know to stay away from that so what would you say makes a bad fight scene i think above all else the worst kind of fight scene is one that is not necessary mm, okay. uh and, and if you go and kind of like I said earlier, if you go to a movie like John Wick or a Jackie Chan movie or something, like you're going to expect fighting and you're going to see fighting. And even if it's not, it doesn't really have to serve much of a story purpose. Like we're there to just watch Keanu Reeves, you know, just kill a bunch of guys and do it in a really cool way. Mm -hmm. And that's what we came to see. And that's fine. But uh, sometimes it's just not necessary to accomplish what you want especially if, especially if you're writing a book it's absolutely not necessary oh gosh uh, that is that is the absolute worst thing it's a lot of wasted opinion. time for you too as the writer to like yeah coordinate all that i think too about um any war movie fantasy war movie in particular that hasn't properly set up the stakes between the two opposing sides so i don't know why i should care about whether or not the main characters are winning yeah, absolutely. Like you, I mean, you can have, uh, I mean, you can, you don't need to have both sides completely invested. Like if you just want your good guy to be facing, like there's some war movies where, like, especially if it's a real life movie where the, uh, the enemy's kind of faceless, you know, and mm -hmm. we really only have stakes for the quote unquote good guys or whatever, then that's like, that's okay. But, uh, you know, if you have something like, uh, I'm trying to think of a good, uh, I don't know. There are definitely uh, times when like, there are like people fighting and you're like, I don't know why anyone is doing anything and I don't care. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think com too much complexity too. Okay. Like when you're trying to do too many things at once in a fight scene and that causes confusion for me, that happens to me a lot with writing, with reading though. And that's because when there's a fight scene, I do this weird thing. I do, I skim with fight scenes. And I think it's because I'm so anxious. <laughs> I don't know if you can tell I'm a bit of an anxious person. Um, I get anxious in fight scenes and I want to know what's happening. So I start darting around the page. Like I take a diagonal path down the page, find like finding keywords and mashing them together and figuring out narrative. So I'm skimming like, okay, what's happening? Is everything okay? Is everything okay? And then yeah. when things get too complex, I'm like, now I'm lost. And that's my fault. But I do think that there is beauty and simplicity. <laughs> yeah, there, there, you really should, less is more. Uh, especially in the written word, less is definitely more. Uh, and I think, you know, that could be the case for, you know, film as well. Like obviously film, we at least have the benefit of a visual spectacle, um, but th there isn't always, it, it is not always necessary to have a big fight scene. Mm -hmm. uh, like, like there are other, you know, and, and sometimes that could just be to the detriment of the movie. 
do you think mm-hmm. that with like the blockbusters and Marvel and all that stuff that fight scenes seem to become the default when it comes to big, uh, I don't know, like climax pieces, you know what I mean? Like, does it always have to be a fight scene or is that just what we become used to? Um, I mean, I think we would have been used to that even before uh, this rise of this superhero renaissance, if you want to call it that. I think even before that, we just, we're just built to expect something like if you want to go all the way back to uh you know like the classic hollywood swashbucklers which mm-hmm. are just all about sword fighting and they almost always have some kind of big climactic sword fight like it, it it's going to be there we just kind of expect it and if you know you want to consider like the uh superheroes kind of echoing that i will say that there are some uh movies that have kind of pushed back a little bit on this notion, uh, one example would be uh, Captain Marvel, where uh, at the end of the movie, um, I remember his character, but Jude Law's character, mm-hmm. you know, they're standing in the middle of the desert and, you know, she's she's all powerful. She's got her powers. And he does this thing where he's like trying to goad her into like, I want you to fight me, like, you know, with no powers, like just one-on-one, prove to me that you can be, and she just like shoots him with an energy wave. Mm-hmm. energy wave and he goes blasted against the cannon wall and she's like i don't have to prove anything to you yeah uh, and and that's a great example like they didn't have a big climactic fight between the two that you, like, and you're expecting it too because you know the movie starts with them doing like a sparring session uh mm-hmm. and you think naturally okay like they're gonna have some kind of rematch because you you, st- you see that all the time and when they do the uh like mentor slash friend turned enemy trope uh they usually do have some kind of uh rematch yeah uh, later on and in this case she's just and and you know he's he obviously knows she's stronger so he's just trying to say like you got to get on my level to really prove Mm -hmm. that you're uh that you're actually that strong she's like no i don't uh and that works and you know not only does that uh do they just do away with the big fight scene it serves the story because it's like the whole story has been about her having to prove herself when, you know, she hasn't really needed to prove anything to anyone other than herself. That's a really interesting take. Yes. The idea that she hasn't had to prove anything the whole time, but she's dealt with that pressure, obviously, because now we know that mentor was toxic, was, was a bad person and how she was able to, like, that was the real conflict uh, that relationship versus the fighting. I, I always feel like in lieu of fights, so we think about like, you know, in WandaVision and the philosophical um, confrontation and in the Sandman situation, it, if it's not a fight, then I feel like it has to do the equivalent of a fight, which is to like itch our brains a little bit, right? Um, surprise us, entertain us, bring some value into the story, bring something full circle, resolve something. And as long as you're able to do that, it doesn't have to be like your traditional physical fight scene. No, not at all. Uh, I mean, you can accomplish a lot of, and you know, even if you do want to have some kind of uh, con- physical confrontation, like it doesn't have to be a long drawn out thing. Like you can make it short and sweet. There's a lot of samurai movies where like when two people fight, it, it you know, it's not usually very drawn out. Like it'll be like kind of quick. Uh, almost like gun drawing in the old west like a lot of times they do a showdown like showdowns aren't long at all like they stand the longest part is the anticipation waiting for them to stand there and then like the clock strikes noon and then they draw and then that's it and like you know it's not really you know it's all about the tension Mm -hmm. Uh, and you know it gets resolved right there they don't need to have a huge shootout over it do you have any other examples of bad fight scenes Um, i'm actually going to talk about a, a bad fight scene that wasn't Okay. As in, uh, they realized it was bad and they took it out of the movie. Really? Oh, so yes. we never got to see the fight scene? No, we did not. Okay, what is it? Because they, rea- they realized it was bad. It is from the end of Lord of the Rings Return of the King. Uh, okay. I'm going to go back to that. So at the end of Return of the King, uh, there's the battle at the Black Gate, which is when, you know, Aragorn uh, leads, like, you know, this army in a last ditch attempt to distract Sauron so that Frodo can destroy the ring. Uh, Now, originally, when they shot this, Sauron himself was supposed to manifest physically 
and come out and he and Aragorn were going to fight each other. Like he was going to come out. Really? He was gonna, yes. He was going to come out looking like he did uh, in the prologue of Fellowship, like in the black armor. He was going to have a mace and everything. And he would come out um, and then he and Aragorn would fight. And the armies would fight too, but like it was supposed to be, you know, this big dramatic set piece where Aragorn and Sauron are fighting one-on-one. Okay. Uh, uh, and then they shot it too. Like you, they shot the whole thing. Uh, they, you can see behind the scenes footage of the movie uh, where Sauron is there. Someone is there as Sauron in full armor with the mace and they're fighting. Um, and then uh, they realized when they were in editing that in post-production that it just wasn't necessary. And I mean, you know, let's let's ignore the fact that let's ignore the fact that this was not even in the book. This was nowhere to be found in the book, uh, which like that's already a mark against it. Yeah. But uh, it why does he have to show up? Like, because Sauron has always been his most imposing. First of all, when he's not physically present, uh, he's always been this very, uh, you know, overwhelming presence. Like with just the name, like it's always been. Uh, just this atmosphere around him like not Mm -hmm. necessarily his physical threat um and then the other thing is that the whole point of that battle is not you know they they were i believe they originally put that in because they wanted aragorn to be doing something heroic uh have some kind of heroic fight but you know they realized that it's not about the battle it's about frodo trying to destroy the ring and if they had kept in that fight scene it would have you know kind of cheapened Frodo's part of the story uh because you know it's just that's just not what that's just not that wasn't what that whole part of the story was about so we didn't need Sauron to show up and they actually you know technically the footage is still in the movie they just uh CGI'd over Sauron and made it a cave troll instead oh really yes so if you go watch the movie again you'll see Aragorn uh fighting a cave troll uh, which, you know, and I mean, it's not really, uh, you know, it's not made into a huge deal the way you would expect Sauron to. He just kind of starts fighting this cave troll. But really, they just, you know, they put a cave troll over Sauron so that they were like, okay, like, well, we shot this footage. We got to do something with it. Let's make him fight a cave troll because that won't that won't completely overshadow Frodo's part of the story. And Aragorn still gets to do, still has an action scene. Uh, he's still doing something okay well i mean i i really appreciate that they kept to the integrity of the story and the purpose of the story because yeah, yeah. i would have cheap i feel like it would have cheapened frodo's entire yeah. role absolutely I, I remember learning about that i was just like what they actually did that it's unbelievable but uh, it, that's an example like peter jackson realized that would have been a mistake to include it uh and i you know it, it is important that we recognize when someone makes a correct choice and diverts from something that would have probably been people would have been way more hard on return of the king if they had put that in there so then let's talk about it from the writer's perspective because now we are responsible for setting the foundation of fight scenes and we've just talked about all the things that hinge on fight scenes so how the heck do you even begin do you have fight scenes in your work what do you do you use action figures do you mock it all out what do you do (laughs) i have heard of people using action figures which i i think is a great idea um and i love i love that idea i don't personally do that um um, i do have a lot of action scenes um in the most recent book that i'm currently editing uh there are you know there are more like in the in the science fiction western there's a lot more shooty shooty uh, okay. which is a little bit easier to do because like you can just say that like you know you can make it pretty fast paced by just saying that like they shot at people uh, mm-hmm. and that they you know like you can still get into some technical aspects of so, like maybe if there's a brief hand-to-hand moment but otherwise not that complex but the most recent one is more of a uh, more of your typical kind of fantasy with swords and melee combat uh, so I did write a lot of fighting for that um for i think the most important thing to remember that as a writer in the written word your fight scene is never going to be as much of a blood pumping spectacle because you can't you can't if you tried to write a fight scene that was just like a kung fu movie 
it'd be like, oh, and then he punched, and then he kicked, and then he dodged, and then he got hit, and then he punched. And it's just nobody wants to read that. <laughs> That's exactly that would make me skip over the pages. Absolutely. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. I for me personally, if I'm doing a uh, if I'm doing a larger battle scene, um, I like to get a pen and paper and and just sketch out like the battlefield. Uh, okay. And and a lot of that has to do with just we need to have a sense of place. We need to kind of know the geography of the fight. Um, and it's much the same way that in a movie, we you got to know what's going on because if you have too much shaky cam or you're doing too many cuts and it just gets so disorienting and you don't know what's going on, then people, people aren't going to like your fight scene. You know, mm -hmm. it needs to be clear. Um, and I think the same thing goes for the book is that like you want to kind of know where your characters are and know what kind of the flow of the action is and uh, have an idea of where they are in your head. Because, you know, if you don't know, then your audience is gonna, isn't going to know and they're going to get confused. Uh, and uh, that's how I like to kind of see where everyone is. The other thing I like to do is uh, I might sometimes, if I'm talking about like the nitty gritty, like an actual hand to hand, I might try and like physically mimic uh, what I want my character to do. Like if I'm pretending like, oh, like if someone is uh, coming at me with, uh, I don't know, if someone's trying to like kick me in the head, like what would I do and like what would that feel like and i you know do like an action or like what do i do if someone gets me in a headlock and maybe i'll ask someone to put me in a mm. headlock to, <laughs> to get a good idea of that uh just to sort of mimic it out because then that helps when you're uh writing the actual physical movement of the character and i mean i don't think uh you know it's not always good to get into full-blown stage direction because if you're too much like and then he brought his arm up to block diagonally like you don't want to get too too technical yeah uh, but you certainly can get into their head uh i mean like if you if you're in a headlock you know like try and put yourself in that headspace like okay you're in a headlock like what, what does that feel like yes and being able to capture the character's fear hesitation because a lot of my confrontations tend to be dialogue driven and there's a lot more questing I guess you can say, where you're trying to get something accomplished and the risk is whether or not you can reach it. And then you you have the final confrontation and then the actual fight is like a one and done, you know? And oh, I was yeah. like, oh, I don't think I've actually had to choreograph a fight scene. And I've read plenty of books that do. And I find that books that do it really well do exactly what you say, which is get inside the character's head so that you understand the stakes. And then I've seen ones where they're so descriptive and so technical, they end up slowing down the pace and you get kind of lost in, in the action, if that makes sense. Yeah. And that's, you know, that is really hard to avoid. Uh, and I've definitely done it before where like I get a little too like blockbuster action movie in my fight scene. And then I just have to try to pare it down. Um, I th and they tell you this, like I took one script writing class when I was in college uh, and they talked about also like you know not giving too much stage direction in your script mm. uh because you gotta let the actors work it through them work through it themselves too i mean it's different if you're like if someone stabs someone it's like okay you obviously have to put that in there but uh you know like you don't need to be super technical with like what specific movements they're doing or where they're going because you gotta let them have some freedom i think the same thing can kind of go with uh, in the written word, because you want your, sometimes it's easier with less description because then you're, you can trust your reader to flip your reader to fill in some of the blanks, mm -hmm. you know, uh, like you don't, like if you want to say, uh, like if they're, if the fight scene is kind of moving from like, I don't know, if they're fighting on steps and then you want to say like the fight continued onto the ramparts of the castle you don't need an extremely detailed account of how they move from the steps to the rampart. It's like, you could just say that and the reader will fill in the blank of like what that action is supposed to look like. Because if you get too technical, then like you said, it is going to kind of bog it down and you don't really need all that in there. You just you know, trust, trust your reader to picture some of the more continuous action. And then when you got to fill it in for a more emotional beat, or if someone gets physically injured, then that that's when you go back in and you can get, a little bit more technical.
I love the revisions process because I feel like that's what you have to do, right? Like you're like, okay, I just need to get stuff in there to know that stuff happens. <laughs> and then the next time I go yeah. through, fill it in. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So for structuring fight scenes, um, I, I've been looking, especially like big, massive, epic, climactic fight scenes, because I feel like that's what a lot of stories are moving towards. And you're like, oh my gosh, the pressure is on. How can I, I can't just write about people fighting for like 10 pages straight. And so I went, after I started learning about, you know, the writing process and taking writing more seriously about four years ago, I started really studying all the TV shows and movies that I was watching. And I was really intrigued by plots, uh, the plot, three part plot structures, all those things. And I wanted to see how they applied to fight scenes, actually. So I'm going to go back to Game of Thrones episode, The Long Night, which is from the last season. It's not the last episode. Couple I think it's the third episode. Yeah, it, it's in a little bit. It, it's the big fight scene that resolves the Night King. And um, there's plenty of other episodes in the Game of Thrones series that has an entire episode dedicated to a fight scene. And I remember during the time that Game of Thrones is aired, that people would get really frustrated if it was just an expositional episode. They were wanting the action. And what they were doing is they were building it up. And so I remember thinking, like, how are they going to pull off this epic? Uh, confrontation. And my observation of it was they followed the three-part structure for the episode and they broke the battle down into those three acts. So the first one, they give you your classic army fights with ground and flight battles that would satisfy anyone who likes your classic, you know, army confrontation, but you can't keep it like that the whole time. I know I would start to get a little sleepy. So in the act two tone shift, that's where you, it takes a breather we start focusing on people. You have people hiding out in the castle. You have dragons up in the sky. Like one dragon is killing the other. You find out the Night King can't be killed by dragon fire. Like all these are now based off of character development and raising the stakes. So that's all of act two right in the middle. And then of course, people still want their violence, right? You got to get back into it. So then act three, and that's when you know that the point of act three is the minute the Night King raises the dead. And oh my God, you have a huge army now um, that you didn't have before. And it's a full-on zombie invasion leading up to the epic showdown where the Night King takes on Bran and at the very last second, Arya swoops in and kills him and the threat is gone. And I rewatched this this week for this episode, uh, for this uh, recording. And I was like, oh my God, it's like, say what you want about the very ending finale. But that episode was so epic. I wish I had just ended there. <laughs> I don't mean, I don't know how big it could have, but it was a great example of the three plot confrontational structure. Yeah, there's a lot of usage of a like, yes, but no and uh, mm -hmm. structure where like this, you know, things, it operates in the same way that, you know, any story should where there's highs and lows in the narrative um, and the, the stakes keep changing depending on, uh, you know, what happens next. So if you want to say, uh, the part I always remember is the Dothraki charge at the very beginning of the fight. Uh, mm -hmm. And they have like all the fire on their weapons. Uh, and it's like, oh, did they get fire weapons? And it's like, yes, but they almost immediately get annihilated, uh, <laughs> which is like that really, like one of the best things you can do for a large, uh, well, I mean, really for any battle scene, but I feel like uh, a large one in particular, because there's always a lot of build up to it, is like setting the stage for just how much danger uh, your heroes are in. Because it's like, okay, like we we know, like th there have been encounters with uh, the White Walkers before, but uh, like in this particular case, it's like we want to say, like, okay, how screwed are we? It's like, well, we sent all our cavalry in to fight with flaming weapons, which we know is one of the few weaknesses of uh, a White Walker, and they're almost all dead. And this is only the beginning of the fight. So from there, it's like, oh, geez, where can the battle possibly go from here? That's actually my favorite part is when you you kind of set up this expectation and then almost it almost has like comedic value to it when you immediately extinguish its potential and you're like, oh, shit, that plan did not work. And now we're all kind of in the dark. No one knows what to expect. And I love that because sometimes when you go into the battle, having an idea of what's going to happen, you're going to assume, OK, I can kind of predict what's going to happen now. But to do a reverse on them, I, I thought that was great. Absolutely. Especially like when and you mentioned like the scene where the you know they resurrect uh they resurrect the dead and then mm -hmm. the army just gets bigger and it's like most people probably saw that coming but at the same time uh you know 
but let's assume that you didn't. Uh, and in typical battle structure, it's like anytime the good guys start getting the upper hand at about like the act two mark, uh, and then you're like, okay, what is something's gonna mess it up because they can't win here. Like mm -hmm. this is too premature. And then, then and then that happens, and it's just like, oh, great, we're even worse off than we were before. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I just remember, I remember the night it first aired, and I'm watching on the edge of my couch, and I'm just like, what is gonna happen? I felt like there was just so many great um, things about that series before reaching the end um like for example i don't remember if it was that season or the previous season but when daenerys loses her dragon and it becomes a night dragon or ice dragon i can't remember now i would just remember like being heartbroken you know oh, so. yeah, it's horrifying it's horrifying one of the biggest assets that they have like got turned over to the bad guys mm -hmm. what other advice do you have for structures of fight scenes so I tried to go for a very, I tried to think of a very different kind of fight scene compared to, because you had told me that you were going to do the long night and I was thinking like, okay, I don't want to do a big climactic battle. Uh, like what's another example of a fight scene I could outline. And I decided to go with um, the duel between Inigo and the man in black from The Princess Bride. Yes. Okay. Uh, and, and I mean, <laughs> It, can you tell that I love sword fights? I just love sword fights. They're great. Uh, uh, but so, and now this is great because I mean, this fight is like, I don't know, it's like four minutes, maybe, maybe a little less than that. It's pretty short, but you can find the three act structure of it. Uh, you know, I mean, the stage gets set, first of all, as like, you know, we don't, all we really know about both characters is that uh, Inigo has spent his whole life uh, learning to sword fight and that he wants to avenge his father's murder. And the man in black, who is, you know, very obviously Wesley, I think even first time viewers could possibly mm -hmm. guess that. But even then, we don't know a whole lot about him other than he was strong enough to climb up the cliff and he loves Buttercup. And that's about all we know. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's not it's not between a hero and a villain. It's two characters that we kind of like both of them. Uh, mm -hmm. Like we, we don't necessarily want one to triumph over the other. But now we're just kind of like, oh, like what's going to happen here? And it starts off like, you know, it starts off with they're just kind of sizing each other up. They, you know, Inigo disadvantages himself by fighting left-handed. And, you know, they chat about different fencing styles. And so we can see like, okay, they're both familiar with the school of fencing. So they're both at least on the same level. And then, you know, finally, uh, Inigo's like, well, like, I think you're better than I am, but I'm not left-handed. And then he switches hands. And that's about where act one would end. Uh, so now Inigo overpowers him and the butler and wesley's like i'm not left-handed either and then he actually manages to disarm him and inigo is shocked uh and because he's now he's like wait like like what like this guy's actually even better than i thought i completely underestimated him it's it's almost like the equivalent of being like this isn't my final form mm -hmm. uh, uh <laughs> and that's where act two ends where you have both of them now they are both have kind of revealed uh, that they're not holding back any longer and then in Act Three, they're really going at it now. Like this, there's no playing around. You can see that like Inigo is actually starting to get frustrated. Uh, he can't believe that there's someone that's better than him. And at the end of it, he's like, you know, they're doing like a very classic kind of fencing style. Then Inigo like takes his sword in two hands and just starts swinging it at Wesley, just so angry. And then Wesley wins because of that. And Inigo is all sweaty and he's in disgrace. And then Wesley doesn't even kill him. He just knocks him out and like instantly we have you know we feel bad for Inigo because we know that he you know really thought he was like the best of the best and that he has a he has an admirable goal uh but Wesley also doesn't kill him you know he mm -hmm. says like I I hold you in high respect I'm not going to kill you so he just knocks him out mm -hmm. uh, and so now you have both you know we not only are we are sympathetic towards one character but now we also have kind of shifted to the point of view of a different character and then we follow wesley's perspective for pretty much the rest of his time i love that fight scene i didn't watch princess bride until i was in my late teens when it came on like i, don't, I think it was comedy central late late at night and i remember seeing that confrontation and i didn't even watch it from the beginning because you know cable and uh, I, I remember instantly thinking, I love these two characters. And I don't know much about their backgrounds at all, but just the way that you see that character development and, and of course the comedy uh, and the fact that they kind of left, you know, it, on, in a positive, you know, way, as you were saying. Uh, yeah, but that's such we, a great one. The stakes aren't like 
too too high like i mean you know and it's pretty like light-hearted mostly uh for the whole thing and uh and and it's a great example of a fight scene where uh the goal isn't necessarily a defeats b but more like we get to see each character's prowess and kind of how they stack up against each other and then also like that that presents a relationship later on because like when they're teaming up to rescue buttercup it's like you know inigo knows oh the man in black beat me like then he must be able to help us Mm -hmm. i love that um it says a lot about that did you ever watch their reread over the pandemic with the actors they did it (laughs) live i did not but i do remember uh reading about that okay the actor for inigo was so into it i just you could just likable people likable characters um that's a great example I actually have a question for you that a listener submitted. Are you ready to to move on to this? Yes, please. Okay. So I put out a story on Instagram asking people to submit their questions ahead of time. And I got one for this specific topic. The question is, how do you make fight scenes feel frantic? Ooh, that is a good question. I think the best way to, if if we're talking about the written, writing it down, not in movies, uh, we're talking about writing it down. I think the best way to do it is to really stick to your stick in the character's head and show that they feel frantic. Um, mm-hmm. It's not necessarily in how you show the, cause obviously in movies you can show how frantic it is like just with the camera work or mm-hmm. uh, you know, the choreography. But you know, if you have like, if your character, um, I don't know, like if your character is fighting down, I don't know if they're sword fighting and he's completely inept, like you want to kind of show that, like, tell me like, well, how does the sword feel in his hand? Does, are his hands sweaty? Does it feel mm-hmm. awkward? Uh, how, like, what does it sound like when his opponent is battering him with his sword? Like, what is he, is he feeling the vibration of his arm? Like, is the blade like inches away from his face? Like really get inside their head and what they're feeling. Like, I don't really need to know physically what's happening, but I need to know how the character is feeling. Mm-hmm. Uh, like you, if, if you make it, if you make them, if you show uh, what they're feeling, like and how they're feeling frantic, like you can make the fight feel more frantic that way. Um, and especially like if you kind of set the stage early on with like just how, uh, like if it's a if it's a chase kind of fight scene, like if they're trying to like sort of run away and fight at the same time, it's like, well, what are they running from? Why are they trying to get to? Uh, you know, make the reader feel that franticness by going deep into the point of view of your character. Yeah. And it's a great question. And I didn't, um, I wrote it down, but didn't think about it because I knew I was going to be surprising you with it. And I didn't want to come in like unfair with anything um, pre pre uh, planned. So thinking about this question too, right now in the moment, other ways too, that you can create something frantic. My thought was, depending on the circumstance, of course, everything is so different, depending on the story you're writing. But I always think that if you can jump POVs um, with with cliffhangers, between those POVs, if it's if it suits the story, that helps me with like feeling like, oh my gosh, what's happening next? What's happening next? Because I like the I, I like the use of cliffhangers, and whether that or like shorter chapters, um, to kind of f- make it feel more frantic and the movement is going. There's one uh, there's one book I read, oh, oh gosh, the Incredible Life of Sia something. I'm gonna butcher it. I'll correct it <laughs> uh, later. It's a story about a, a girl whose mother disappeared, and so she. They, she lives in the in the Tucson area. I got the book because it had Suaros on the cover. And uh, she thinks her mom could have been abducted by aliens or something like that. And so every every um, night she goes out with a candle and has a lot of Hispanic, Mexican cultural things. It's a great book. And at the end of the, the story, the book already has very short chapters. But then when you get to the final confrontation, the chapters are like a page. And you find yourself flipping. So then you have the physical feeling of that franticness too associated with it. So I always thought that was such an interesting way to make a fight scene seem chaotic. Yeah, chapter length and point of view, uh, point of view can definitely affect that. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned that because uh, if you're doing like a kind of thriller pacing thing where they're very short chapters and each end of the chapter is kind of cliffhanger-y, like that is definitely going to keep the reader like, but like, wait, wait, what, 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 what's going on? Mm -hmm. And the point of view thing, especially because, you know, if you have multiple point of view characters you know not everyone does but if you know if we if you are doing a large point of view battle and 
you shift around to different perspectives. Like you can have this like, oh, one character was fighting and then they, I don't know, got they got hit in the leg and they go down. And then you cut to another character. And then it's like, oh no, wait, like it wasn't like, wait, uh, I'm not done with them. Uh, but oh, what's happening here? Like so-and-so is like trying a really dangerous stunt or something like that. Um, you know, and that's another way uh, to keep things feeling frantic with not just the overall action itself, but uh, with what you're doing with the pacing of your story. Mm -hmm. Well, that was it for my questions. I really enjoyed talking to you about fight scenes because it's always a joy to have uh, speculative conversations with you. Do you have any final words of advice for writers that want to wrap their heads around fight scenes? Uh, just reiterate what I said before, you know, less is more. Um, in most cases with fight scenes, you know, they don't need to be very drawn out. Like, you know, as long as we care about the character or characters and you get inside uh, their head, you know, you can still build a really cool action set piece with some cool powers. Like, I don't know, if, you're, uh, if your character can fly or whatever, uh, has some kind of super strength ability, you can have all that stuff in there and show off their abilities but at the end of the day uh you know we you know we just want to feel thrilled uh and the best way to do that is to just stay in the character's head stick as close to them as you possibly can speculative sandbox is a volunteer-run podcast that relies on the collaboration of fellow creators like you Join the conversation and participate in fun polls and questionnaires on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter. Interested in being in a future episode? Our DMs are open, or you can email speculativesandbox at gmail.com.